deep in an underground secret Pacific Island lair, Pop Culture Minefield presents Saturday Morning Fun Time. This is the Comic Relief Crusader telling you to get your morning cereal ready because here we go. Yeah, all right. It's Saturday morning fun time. And we're here. Ooh. Delicious caffeine. Um, wouldn't it be we weird if they put out a drink that just has caffeine and nothing in it? <laughs> no flavor. Just straight caffeine. I wonder how that would taste. Ooh. When I'm drinking, it's delicious. So it is Saturday morning, and I was laughing during the whole opening titles because right before Bill left, he says, okay, I'm going to get myself off now. <laughs> I, I'm glad. Did you guys you hear him Mr. say Gary. that? I was just laughing. <laughs> so, You're okay, the I'm most mature person off. here, Gary. I just want you to know. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> So um, our show is brought to you, of course, by the delicious Fuel Up. Uh, Wake is the uh, great way to start your day. It's how I like starting my day. Uh, not only does it have a slow release of 180 milligrams of caffeine that'll last you throughout the day, um, it's, it's chock full of other uh, delicious minerals. And um, it, it's, it's supplemental. And it really does a hell of a job. It, my days, I used to take my old man naps. Don't tag him anymore. Uh, because that stuff keeps me going all day long and not like jittery because that's really sucks when you get the caffeine jitters never get them i'm always calm running and and doing things and focused is the other thing i like about it I, i'm so focused on what i'm doing the only thing that distracts me is when martin starts talking about something while i'm trying to do something that's the only time i get distracted so but who's all here who's who's in the comments we got uh uh, Monk oh, Jubis, hello, thank you. Come again is here. Uh, and I'm a confused love of my life. And th is that it? Is nobody else coming? Yep. My goodness, it says six people have already gotten here. So, but Sad it's Saturday morning Saturday. fun time. And today's show, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite films of all time. It is in my top 20 list of favorite films of all time. And it stars Jeff Goldblum and Michelle Pfeiffer with a slew of cameos in it including Rick Baker, the Academy Award-winning makeup artist. Uh, he plays part of a drug dealer. Um, what do they call those? The people that park your cars for you at restaurants and hotels. Chauffeur. Chalet parking? Chalet, thank you. Uh, and he's like, hey, you want some, want some cocaine? Want some, want some speed? Want some... <laughs> he's like, no, yeah, we... seriously, we're good. <laughs> Dude, we even have the writer for Empire Strikes Back. Um Gazan himself, he was. Oh, the the yeah, the screenplay. He's the second. He's the one who sh wrote the the um, shooting script because the person who wrote the um, um, original script to that died before she could do a, a re edit, and that's how Gazan got well, brought in. Everybody's pouring in now. We have Penny and Bush. Sean Eastep. Oh, Penny's here. Bush. Bush is here. My good friend Bush. Uh, good to see you guys. Christopher is here, DePerno. Uh, hey, Chris, you're welcome on the show if you want to join us and talk about this movie. Uh, I love Chris. and uh, But uh, we have somebody else sitting in the back right now that uh, I, uh, you know, I brought up cocaine and all that stuff, so it's perfect time to bring in uh, the cop. <laughs> and, of course, uh, Patrick Jordan is uh, retired um, chief of the sheriff's department for Los Angeles, which means he was a hard ass. And uh, also, by the way, chiefs, as I recall, are, are slightly political animals, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you have to learn how to maneuver. You have to know how to maneuver. Politics. Yeah. Not, not necessarily be, you know, those that were political. You have to have, understand the language though. You do. And I yes. think that gives you a really good step up on understanding how to talk about things and communicate about these ideas and what you fought for. And, and I do look at the, uh, the blue line as the final last blue line against some of the crime in this country. And we've got people in this country that are just trying to destroy that. And if yeah, they do, it's, we're going to well, be in I, trouble. I that's why I'm looking forward to the show. Cause I get to watch movies, talk about the movies, but then talk about how they relate to today 
I mean, Boom, Dirty baby. Harry is is absolutely the first Dirty Harry is absolutely um, uh, uh, an iconic movie, but it also relates really well to what's going on. You know, rising crime, uh, soft on soft on criminals, tough on cops, kind of thing. And I get to talk about that. Of course, you know, you get a lot. I'm of sorry, people. read that, Patrick. What, what I, oh, hello, cop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's our well, that's chief to you, buddy. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's we don't call the show your name. We call you the chief on the show. So it's morning coffee with the chief. Oh, yeah, but man. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I love reading some of the comments in the um, chat and you seeing know, your reaction. You know, I, you know, you asked me about because you've been trying to catch me um, using some bad language, and uh, yeah, you and, just don't do it. And uh, one of the things that uh, you know, so I, uh, as as some of the guys make comments about me, there is nothing anybody can call me that I have not been called before. You know, um, you know, when you're working in police work, you better be thick skinned because it's coming your direction. It's coming fast. If you're a little overweight, you'd be called fat. If you're a little bald like I am, you'd be get called a baldy. And, and as well as all those other nasty things that they get called you. So and, and, and so, you know, and I'll get a chance to talk about that on the show as, as time goes on, uh, you know, being thick skinned and some of these guys that re overreact in some of these movies like, you know, what are they taking? You know, you don't get to do that. <laughs> but uh, like I said, there's not much anybody can say about me that I haven't already heard. And by the way, um, have you ever watched Donut Operator on YouTube? I, you know, yes, I have. He he comments on um, the crime stuff. I I, I I like his stuff. He He's does really breakdowns right of shootings. You know, he he talks about the law enforcement issues. He's not. Um, He's supportive of law enforcement, but he doesn't, you know, he doesn't even pull any punches when law enforcement. No, he doesn't. Say. When they screw up, he calls them out on it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I do like him because he, he presents well and he's very articulate in how he says it. Uh, and which, you know, the, the thing about today when we talk about law enforcement, common sense is not so common, right? You know, uh, with the mainstream media and, and how we look at law enforcement. And, you know, it's for me, it's like, well, how, how do you expect to keep somebody on the ground who's struggling without putting a knee in their back? You know, which is now if you put a knee in their back, oh, my God, you you, you killed them. Right. I don't know how many times I put knees. In I can't back breathe. Come down. You know, it's you, an eighth thing. Right. You're told yeah. to yell you know, now. I remember when you were a kid and you were I had siblings and you were and you're wrestling and you got a little you got the advantage on your sibling and they oh, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And of course, they're lying. They just want you to loosen their grip so they can get out. Right. And you go, ha ha. Right. Get away. Ha ha. I win. <laughs> Right. Yeah, so, I know. I know. I watch that shit. And he breaks those down too um, on Donut Operator. I'm a big fan. And I'm not telling you you're full of shit, monkey, on that comment. Uh, where is it? Uh, the sheriff's yep. also where they're uh, actually, I, I've, I've worked closely with sheriff's departments. And uh, a lot of times it has to do with uniform, it has nothing to do with them trying to look bigger. Um, yeah. I, 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 no, it's, that's, but the fact is, it they want to be intimidating. When, that, when, I, when it, I when I started law know. enforcement, they gave me a, a bulletproof vest, and it was like a postage stamp. All it really did was cover, you know, right or go over your it, heart. It, you know, it didn't cut the cover the sides. It didn't cover you know below the navel. I mean, and and then as time went on, you got these wraparound vests that made you look like you know uh, the, the Michelin Man, right? Um, and, and, you know, and that's the other thing too. You're, you were carrying about 30 pounds worth of weight between your gun belt and your vest, uh, you know, working there. And just to correct some folks in, in LA County Sheriff, it's tan and green. And there are some departments throughout the country where it's brown for sheriffs. My, my uncle was a Wayne County Sheriff. He wore brown, but yeah, we're different. Usually they're different. We're different colors than uh, the cops who are mostly blue in Detroit. They were wearing white for a while, which is a terrible uniform shirt because it gets dirty, but, uh, now I'm I'm curious about something with law enforcement compared to military, because in the military, um, w once we started putting on body armor, we were trained to walk chest forward, twist slightly. Yeah, and it's you know we actually, had a specific there, walk, a... and we we're taught to walk chest forward because you don't want to be sideways because there's no armor on your sides, my and dad, all your armor is up my front. My dad taught at the range for the Detroit Police Department. He was a pistol. He was on their pistol team and all that other stuff. And they had a method. I want. I think it was the. The, the Seaver method or what, where you're, you were sideways and you pointed your gun sideways and the whole and you were focused and the whole idea was to reduce reduce the surface area that the suspect the problem with that is with the vest you know that was exposed still at the time and then uh, you had a lot of a lot of shots that went in the side hit that descending order and killed guys because they were faced they were sideways so then eventually you got taught when you got vests to to 
to give go ahead and give them your center of mass because you're protected right and um and and most rounds i mean i'll use the statistic it's been a while since i've so most most shootings last time i saw this there was about 10 years ago i think are are they happen within uh seven seconds the shooting's over within seven seconds uh, 70 percent of the rounds are misses by both the suspect and the bad and and the officer because you're in such this high stress thing that mm. people start they're slapping the trigger versus you know pulling the trigger and so they these shootings are very fast and they're over within a few seconds and most of your rounds are going to be misses and and this is with officers trained to shoot center of mass you know we're like i will tell you though on from personal experience uh uh, going to ranges where a lot of local law enforcement would practice the, the biggest group of, um, I will give you, I will tell you both cases Worst shots I would run into were, uh, off duty officers, Yeah. but the single worst shooters I would run into were off duty FBI. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would look at those groupie. I'm like, were you even aiming at the target? The <laughs> you know, thing about shooting is it's a perishable skill. It you is. Have, you got you to keep to, up on it. You have to hit the range. You have to do the time. And when I first started, you had to hit, be at the range once a month. Then costs drove that to once every three months. Then it went to once every four months. Then they created these uh, trailers. You go and you shoot in the back of a trailer. Uh, and um, and it was really just to do the minimum level of qualification instead of really focusing on um, making sure that those. Yeah, I, I was a chief and I went to shoot, right? I was shooting next to a couple of people. And now I don't. I don't go to the range. I don't do the Hogan's Alley stuff anymore. I'm not doing skeet shooting. I'm not doing handgun, shotgun assault. I just go every every three, four months and qualify because as a chief, they don't want to waste their money on you, right? Uh, qualifying. Right. And the, and the, the two people who work in the street next to me failed qualification. <laughs> and I passed. I was the only one who passed. And I was, so it, it just showed me that our department had gotten away from uh, uh, regular training, sufficient training to keep people's skill sets up. And what I've been told recently, and, and you'd be a good one to address on this one, uh, that law enforcement across the country has really increased training time. No, no. When the, the very first thing that happens when you defund a law enforcement agency, the first budget that goes is your training budget and supply budgets. Because uh, it's all... it's, it's all That's a mistake. That's all personnel and benefits is your biggest expense. So when they say, we're going to cut $100 million from the LAP, the very first... Uh, uh, pocket of money they go to or bucket of money they go to cut is your training budget and your supply budget. Uh, and maybe you, you'll, you'll try to extend your car, car lives another year so that you can uh, avoid having to buy some new cars. But uh, no, those, that's the first thing to go because it's the easiest thing to cut where you're not cutting jobs. Yeah, exactly. So, but um, that, and that's a huge mistake. This whole defund the police thing is a big mistake because you want them to be the best trained at what they do. And you want them trained more in, because I remember when that shit started um, when I was a kid, uh, where they were being trained more how to deal with domestic situations, to better deal with those situations. Because you know how quickly they can escalate. Well, and, I think, yes. I, I and de-escalation was something that a lot of them weren't trained to do. And so going into training that specialized in skill sets of dealing with de-escalation of domestic situations is so essential to that job. And I know they're not getting the training they need. Yeah. You know what? It's funny. Um, so I went through the Academy in 83 and right. we were trained some level of de-escalation, but it, if you work the streets for any amount of time, you learn it's better to de-escalate than to fight. Right. So um, your, your best path forward is to de-escalate those situations and, uh, and, and, and calm them down. In fact, I just did a guest lecture at uh, Pepperdine Law School yesterday, and we talked about the value of conflict resolution in law enforcement and organizational change. And I, I touched on some of those subjects. The, the gift of gab, um, the ability to talk people down, is so valuable. And it's one of the things that I had. I think they won't get tired of listening to me because just put the handcuffs on, right? Um, but it, it's, 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 it is way better than, I mean, I was, when I was working streets, I was 11. 180 pounds, I could best run, best run 300 pounds, I could run, you know, forever. Uh, so I was a very fit guy, but I didn't want to fight because, you know, you get hurt. Every time you get in a fight, you get hurt. It, <laughs> so you want to talk your way down. So de-escalation has always been part of the job. It's just emphasizing it as your first tool is probably really the, the where the training comes in. 
Yep. Well, I want to thank you for popping in, uh, Patrick. It was really good seeing you. The Chief. So you got to catch me on Tuesday morning, and I'll uh, be going over Dirty Harry, which is a great movie. movie and uh, thanks for Martin having. will be there. Will you be there, John? I should be. All right. So you'll have these guys to help you run the show. Okay, great, great. Thank you very much, guys. Have a great show. All right, thanks a lot. See you later, Patrick. Bye. Okay, bye. And, uh, and now we're going to be getting into a little film that really in many ways was the last, uh, well, let me go look at his, his thing here. Um, um, I'm going to see if I can find his actual official last good film. But this was really, Into the Night was one of the best, uh, best and, in my opinion, final great films by John Landis. And uh, his career was derailed by the death of Vic Morrow and those two, um, were they Cambodian children? It- this was right, at, it came out right after Twilight Zone, the movie. Yeah, this was already in the works when Twilight Zone was happening. And that's why the film happened the way it didn't had such a, a big cast. But I'm tr- I'm going to go back and look um, because his career just did not happen anymore. Uh, well, he, he got he got to do the Blues Brothers 2000 as a producer, but really his work just oh is so diminished. He did do Dream On. I love that series. He was the executive producer and co creator on that show. And it was the same thing. He was a producer on Sliders. But Amazon Women on Mars, he was a producer. Again, you know, it's like um, his work got really cut by the death of um, the cast in Making Twilight Zone. But uh, I'm going to hit director here now. Yeah, just a lot of small films. Nothing big, nothing big, nothing big, nothing big. Um, Hollywood just didn't really want to work with him very much. There was another good film I did enjoy of his, uh, Innocent Blood, but it it didn't make very much money. It was low budget and almost an independent film. Uh, I don't know if you know the film. It starred Gabriel Byrne and uh, what is her name? God, she's gorgeous. Um, and Anna Pollard. Yep. Oh, it had Robert Loggia and uh, Don Rickles in it too because they had relationships with him. They were friends. Chaz Palminteri. Great cast, but it just uh, never became big. And I thought it was a great vampire film where a cop investigating a series of bizarre murders discovers a vampire who he falls in love with and and in return she does with him. But past that, you know, Oscar was another one I liked that he did with Stallone. But it didn't make much money. In fact, it flopped. Coming to America, I think, was his biggest thing, 88, with Eddie Murphy. But I'm not a fan of the film. I don't know why. It's a good film. It's well written. I just, I don't know. I didn't find it funny. Three Amigos was was good. But these were movies that he already had slated uh, before, meaning that he was contracted to them before they were made. And that's what happened. The minute those films came out in the 80s, you started seeing the slipping by the time the 90s hit. And his career was relatively over as a film director which is sad because i like his films i i like him i don't like his kid uh well gary from what a murphy had said when he was doing coming america he's basically like a massive control freak yeah uh, i've heard so that too but he really got is in into every fight several times on coming to america and that's why people and that might have hurt him too it might have hurt him too but what hurt his career was um, being found guilty in that civil case where they were killed. And it's it's amazing that him and Spielberg didn't go to prison for what they did. Because uh, Spielberg was the force that caused things to happen. And, uh, you know, he was pushing uh, Landis to shoot and keep shooting long hours when those kids weren't even supposed to be on set. But... Despite that, I don't want to get into the, the weeds here with him. Uh, I will say he still put out some good films. I love Three Amigos. It, it, it's a fun film. Dumb. Spies Like Us. Love the film. Dumb. Coming to America. Very funny film. Uh, Eddie Murphy was great in it. Uh, but I just, I, I'm just i just not a fan. Oscar, I really enjoyed. 
Uh, Innocent Blood, it is also one of my top 40 favorite films of all time. Um, Because I think it's up in the uh, 30s on of all the films I've watched. My list used to be available on Facebook, but Facebook got rid of the, the notebook, you know, your ability to write notes. And even though I can still find them, they're hard to find. It's hard to get to them. And I had a list of up to 300 films, I think, was on my list, favorite films of all time. And I've seen well over 10,000 films in my life. But uh, Dream On, I think, is one of the best things he ever produced. Because that was a, a damn good show. And it, like I said before, the main character was raised by being put in front of a TV like I was. I was always in front of a TV as a kid, watching movies or TV shows. So his responses to everything were clips. <laughs> instead of him saying what he wanted to say, instead like Lucy or, or Humphrey Bogart or some character, they'll show a quick clip saying what it is he's thinking. Because he thinks in movie quotes. And I do that all the time. Still do it. Keith does it too. And that's why we laugh at each other about that. But this movie was, um, in my opinion, the best film he ever did after Twilight Zone. Uh, Into the Night is a great thriller. Comedy thriller. Dramedy. Uh, great cast. Great cameo guest. Uh, they got, who was another one? Um, Carl Perkins. The guy who wrote Blue Suede Shoes yeah. is a, a security guard. He gets a fight scene with David Bowie, who's an assassin. What a movie. So we can go ahead and line it up here, man. Get it up there. Get it up on screen. Cronenberg was in the movie. Yes, Cronenberg is in one scene, too. He works. He's uh, Goldblum's boss. And Dan Aykroyd's a co-worker. And the movie right off starts with an overhead of the airport right after the uh, Universal logo. And there's a plane coming in. We don't know why yet because we don't find that out for a little bit. Because we have to then meet Ed Okun. Now, it's interesting, those of you who are nerds in, in like trivia, uh, he has the same name as the doctor from Independence Day that uh, Brent Spiner played. Interesting. Richard Farnsworth is in this. He's a guy who came up as a stuntman and eventually got into acting. I highly recommend this film if you like uh, those thriller comedies. I don't assume anything. The minute I, the fact is, the minute she's not liking something, I notice it and I stop the film or the show because I know how to read when people aren't enjoying themselves. And I really don't want to discuss my relationship now. It's weird. <clears throat> oh, that hurts. What does? The gas prices? Gas prices, man. Yeah. Our eyes are always drawn to those gas prices, man. <laughs> um, hold on a second. I'll tell you where you can see it. Watch. And you got to put the year after it. It's 1985 because there is another Into the Night and it's not as good. You can watch it on YouTube for $3.99. You can watch it on Apple TV for $3.99. You can watch it on Vudu for $3.99. Amazon Prime for $3.99. Redbox for $3.99 and Google Play. You can watch it for $3.99. So it's not available for free that I can see, but it might be available on Roku. Uh, hold on. Let me check here. I'm going to click a link here. Nope, it's not available right now on Tubi. And I will check Roku. Let's see if it's available on Roku. Nope, not available on Roku. So there you go. It is available on those uh, for, uh, you know, video on demand for $3.99. I love this scene. You know, there it's just this beautiful wife with her hair done weird. Uh, and Okun's character is exhausted. 
she's asking, would you like some coffee? And no, 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 I'm good. And then she's like, oh, I got to get to work. He's, he's my partner is coming here early because she does real estate. And it's kind of funny because she's so not paying attention to her husband at all. And she just grabs his plate with the food still on it, uneaten. <laughs> just grabs it, walks away with it, leaves him sitting there with the orange juice. <laughs> and what we've got is a guy who is suffering from severe insomnia. And he's, and insomnia doesn't mean that you don't pass out every once in a while, because he does, he'll pass out. Uh, what it means is you can't sleep normal. And um, here we see him with his ride-along partner and co-worker. Oh, guy checking out titties on, in a car. That is uh, a very big actress right there. Do you recognize her, John? It's Terry Gar. Yeah. Her one cameo in the film is Lady in Car. <laughs> Landis calls in a lot of favors with people to get him in his films. And here we see Dan Aykroyd and him in, in his little Toyota piece of shit. Toy, I recall it's a Toyota. Yeah, and it's a Toyota. I haven't been able to sleep. And, and he's like, well, you know, we've got all these. Yeah, here you go. All right. Mr. No sleep. I have something for you. <laughs> Actually, it's a Cinco de Mayo parade. Uh, I it, Just the banter in this film is a lot of fun. Dan Aykroyd plays your typical um, guy engineer rocket engineer because that's what they do for a living they're engineers this this was yeah this is great ellen kissed me on the top of my head this morning and said have a nice day what a weird thing for a wife to do it's weird and and he's really put off by that shit I, i got a question gary when did jeff goldblum go from being a jeff goldblum actor to jeff goldblum caricature uh, that happened after the 90s when his career tanked. And now he just plays a version of himself. Yeah, I've never heard of a Cinco de Mayo parade either. <laughs> yeah, he's trying to convince him to go get a hooker. Go to Vegas. Get a hooker. And he basically says, all I want to do is sit down and talk to somebody, you know, his wife. But he's not getting what he needs in his relationship. And I think that's putting his, you know, I don't know if you know what homeostasis is, but uh, you have the, the homeostatic process of how your body is always functioning at proper or peak um, performance. And it includes your mind. And your mind, if it's not working at peak performance, something's throwing it off, it can cause things like insomnia. And that's what's going on with this character. He's unhappy. But here he passes out a little bit. And then he has to go to this meeting. And it's funny. And that's, of course, David Cronenberg, the great horror director. There he is. That's Cronenberg. And here's a point where he's so out of it. He's like um, behind in the work. They're talking about like, this is the one we're talking about. You're, you're like way behind and it, it gets him a dirty look from his boss and coworkers here. Signal to noise, right? Um <laughs> And, you know, it's hard to get through this part of the movie and know where it's going. But what you're trying to show is how mundane his life is. He leads a very boring life. That's the whole point of the first act, is to show you how boring his life is. And here's their, they're kind of ostracizing him because he was, he screwed up in the meeting. And he decides, I think I'm going to go home and take a nap, you know, or try to. And um, things don't go well. (laughs) 
And now all of a sudden, that's that gives him a little bit of sympathy. His his uh, wife's partner's car is parked in front of their house. <clears throat> He's like, huh, it's out. Hmm, wonder what that's all about. What's that car doing here at this time of day? Uh, maybe I'll go take a look in the window. <laughs> <laughs> this house still exists. It looks pretty much the exact same to this day. You can find it on, on, go to IMDB and look at all the shooting locations and you can click on the links to go look at the shooting locations for this film. And of course, he sees them in there doing the dirty. Very good, Bush. It's called the, the setup. That's right. You're establishing what the motivation is for your character. And pretty much everything. It's sort of, they do the same thing in Total Recall. Um, it's, it's very similar in how they set this character up, the way the character is set up in Total Recall. You establish that he wants something better than his life, but he doesn't even know he wants something because he can't figure out what's wrong. And his wife is eating ice cream. And um, she's like, you sure well, you want some ice cream? It's really delicious. Well, the, <laughs> at that point, he already saw her being unfaithful, so... <laughs> Yeah, and, and he even asks, uh, you know, how was your day? Because yeah. <laughs> he knows how her day was. And they show that Cal, uh, oh, I remember those commercials. Because we even saw some of those in Arizona. And I remember those Cal commercials. Like, you know, it's Beetlejuice made fun of it. I'll, I'll eat a hog, whatever he would do. It was all based on that Cal Remington or whatever his name was that did the car sales. And they would... They'd play those at Aram and Phoenix. I love those commercials as a kid. That guy was crazy. And this is where he decides, I'm going to get up in. What I think he's doing here is he's decided to fly to Vegas and yeah. do like Dan Aykroyd suggested and get a hooker. I don't know if he in, intends to have sex with her, but he kind of hinted at the fact that he'd just like to have someone that he could just l unload on and talk. Not just lo blow a load on, mm. but you know, unload his emotions on. Unload his load. Yeah. <laughs> I, I made the joke because I knew one of you guys was going to make the joke if I didn't. Um, and like I said, this house looks exactly the same and it's still there. And this is a wonderful moment of uh, lost time that you get with insomnia. Because I've had serious insomnia. And where I blank out and the cops pull up to him and go, hey, man. Light's green. <laughs> He's just sitting there in a daze. I like that moment. Then he goes to the airport, and he's trying to, you know, and you can see it in his, his reaction, like, do I do this? Do I really do this? No, I'm, I, I shouldn't do this. And right at the moment, you know, when um, he makes his decision, everything is out of his hands. Because that's when the story starts. Up to now, we've had what's what would refer to in a book as a prologue. This is now the actual beginning of the movie. Uh, the minute Michelle Pfeiffer comes into the picture, the movie has officially really begun. So he's sitting there like, should I do this? Shouldn't I do it? Now we see her get out of an elevator with this uh, guy. You don't know what he is. You know, he's darker skinned. So, but then, you know, you see these guys running up and they murder him and they grab her. And then she gets away from him because I think they're going to kill her too. And you don't know why. They slice his throat. And the movie has now officially started. And she's running. And that is going to be continuing through the rest of the movie on the run. And one of these guys, the one with the glasses in the back there, that's John Landis. He never talks. He's Silent Bob. And he does a lot of the physical comedy in this film. A lot of slapstick, trying to open a door and keeps hitting himself in the face with the door. That was funny. And this is where she runs up and jumps into his car, jumps over the edge and jumps into her car go 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 and he's like uh what am i doing then he sees them and and uh 
the the show begins. So no longer is he worried about, you know, should I go to Vegas and get a hooker or shouldn't I? He now has a beautiful woman on the lam in his car being chased by some gun-toting crazy guys. And they get, oh, I like this scene where these guys get out of the um, van like, man, you crazy? Because they, they get At out. Airport, like, Hooker comes to LAX. You. LAX. That's right. And they're trying to tell the security that something happened. And she's like, no, nothing happened. Just go. Just go. I just want to go. And because there's something that he doesn't know and, and we, the audience, don't know. Uh, and you'll find out when we get to the apartment scene. And um, and I'll go ahead and let the, the cat out of the bag. <laughs> Literally. Um, she has the jewels in a, a package stuffed up her hoo-ha. Hidden in her hoo-ha. And, um, and he's never made aware of this. He's unaware of it the whole time. So it's a jooch. <laughs> her juchi. And she, you know, immediately just, please, can you take me here? The, you know, you know, and, and she's kind of begging him to help her. And so he does. He's that kind of person. Hey, Wade. Cat back door. Yeah. Yeah, you got your one. <laughs> oh, Sparkly and we have, hoo-ha. And we had another for, from Monkey Jeeves. So we got one, so I got to play two. All right, let me get to him. Uh, no, she's playing the front door, not the... Uh, maybe we only need like three stink bombs. You better give me the other ones. Okay, I drop these three stink bombs, smell out the joint, and slip out the back door. And one more, one more, here we go. Maybe we can get in through the back door. Um, so she asked for him to take her to the shop very rich played by and he's not there and instead we get Jake from Body by Jake he's got each other and drink and I'm with this in the drink uh this guy's in his 70s he's still training back your sound is coming yeah you you become muscle. Charlie Brown adult wah 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 okay is it okay now Yep, still sounding. I didn't do anything to fix it. Now, now it's back. <laughs> Is it back yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I said again, no, I didn't back. do anything. Okay, Bart. It's just one of those things that happens. Um, so he's telling her, don't come on board. You're not welcome here. And she wants to just, can I stay the night? And he's going to be a dick about it. No. Well, he has his orders. Well, there's really another reason. Yeah. You'll find out what it is. And he's not that great an actor, but I do like Jake. He's a good guy. He's very helpful with people. He's... Very good with his fans. And he's been a professional bodybuilder for 40 years. Uh, no, 50 years. 50 years. So she has to um, go back to the car. And now we find out why. He has a girl on board that he wants to do the naughty with. He's like, hey, baby, it's your turn now. Take your shit off, huh? Oh, it's Monkey Jeebus. <laughs> Which one? Both of them. That's I always right. knew he was a boob. If Monkey Jeebus is a tit, he's two tits. And then they show up to spoil the party. Now, is that a Nissan logo or is that Toyota? It's a Toyota. Okay, so it was a Toyota. I think it was the same model of Gung Ho. Ah, yeah. 
That's a movie we should do too. I love that movie. I like you. You make me rough. <laughs> what a great line. So now they're tearing the yacht apart looking for something because she was me. there. <laughs> Sit down. Well, this one does. <laughs> he actually does look a little like Sadam. He's got the right mustache. So now they go to her, and I guess her brother's apartment. You'll meet her brother. Played by another uh, Landis alum. Uh, he played D-Day in Animal House. Bruce McGill. Oh. Bruce McGill. Love that guy. We've had him. Uh, we haven't lost him yet, have we? He's still alive, uh, right? Yeah, I think he's still alive. Yeah, he's still alive, I think. I'm going to double check. because uh, I saw he's still working, too. Yes, we still got him. I love that guy as an actor. Yeah, I think his brother, uh, her brother likes Elvis. <laughs> Where did you get that idea? And in the end, you know, you find out she did too, but for a different reason. I'm hoping that it captured that that moment because it's one of my favorite moments. When she goes, I knew Elvis. She's in the other room, changing clothes. And that's when we get a glimpse of her and he's checking out these old photos it's really neat and there we see her pulling something out of her hoo-ha no boobs or ass really showing so i didn't censor it and i didn't have to censor that because she walked by me Yeah, he's making phone calls. And, oh, we, we didn't see here in the slideshow, but she even walks by the door completely naked. <laughs> That's what I was saying. She walked by nude, and I'm glad that it didn't get captured so I didn't have to censor it. But he looks at her, and he just smiles. Yeah. He just smiles. Well, Not like a dirty smile. He just smiles. Yeah. Like, oh, that was nice. We've got some more people that have popped in. Uh, let's see. Slasher Fred is here. Hey, Slasher Fred. Zach's our good friend, Kyle. How you doing today, buddy? Uh, Peter Vinkman Fansite is here. Hi, Vinkman's girl. Keely Chow is here. Uh, let's see. Andy Morrow. Andy is the great inundator of my time on Facebook because he messages these great memes at me. Just constantly sends gifts and memes. <laughs> Shit, I love it. Zacharot315 is here. Greetings. James Andrew Morrison. The Memes of Distraction is here, man. Hey, good to see you. We hardly see you anymore, man. Hope you're doing well. Real Wade Nation, of course, is here. Our good friend Wade. And there he is, McGill. And he's an Elvis impersonator. I couldn't figure out if he's yeah. an impersonator. He just dresses that way. No, he's, a, he's an impersonator. A professional impersonator. And it leads to one of my favorite moments when he's, you know, he lent out her car. And she goes, that's a $50,000 car. And he says, it was a gift to you. So, like, that somehow devalues the value of the car. And he's just shitting on her, calling her dirty names and stuff, because she left him high and dry when she left the country. Uh, without telling him where she was or giving him money for rent and all that shit. And uh, <laughs> I like that. You drive a beige Toyota, right? Yeah. And then when he's walking out the door, she goes, "I, you forget, I knew Elvis. And he, he gets mad and throws something at her face. He says, you didn't know him. You just fucked him. And I was like, oh, that's uh, 
Actually, most fans would like want to know that person <laughs> for having had sex with the king. That's funny. I mean, fans are weird like that. Scott's here. What's up, Scott? I thought you guys were out. It is, um, what is it? Recycling day when they take everything to the recycling. Saturday. And now when he starts to leave, because he's had enough. I'm done. I want to go. He spots those guys are there. We're back. <laughs> That's Scott. <laughs> We're back. He's going to break out the grill today. We're going to do some grilling this afternoon. Uh, I put the marinade out for him. I hope he saw that it's on top of the corn. We got corn, potatoes, and steak. It, it'll be nice. I love that car. And of course, there's John Landis in the back just looking at him. And he blankly stares back at him and then honks at him to get the hell out of the way. This is brazen as hell. You looked what up? I looked it up for research purposes. She's skinny. Oh, this. Oh, well, it's a sad thing. You know, there's a lot of pretty uh, women without asses. It's sad, but true. Um, what is her name? She's one of the, the she's one of the main characters in Archer, uh, black comedian. The she, one that plays Lana. Lana, yeah. She's made an entire routine about the fact that she's like the only black woman on the planet with no ass. <laughs> she's got a flat ass. <laughs> and she's telling him, I don't know who those men are. And he just doesn't know whether he trusts her or not because he feels, constantly feels like she's withholding information from him. And then you uh, see this I... and you're like, what the hell is going on? Hostage situation? Guy with a gun in the ears. Oh, it's a movie set. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's Aisha Taylor. That's her name. Aisha Taylor. Yeah, she's hilarious. I like her. She took over as the host for Drew Carey on Whose Line Is It Anyway? And this is a series of gags moving forward from here with Jeff Goldblum because he's never been on a movie set before his character. So he doesn't know when something's fake. <laughs> And this is an actress friend of hers, and she's going to try to go stay with her I'm down on the beach. Here comes the first gag. It's not a real phone. <laughs> and the guy walks up and grabs it and goes, funny, pal, <laughs> and grabs it and pulls it away from him. <laughs> then he walks over by these ladies in bikinis uh, and leans against the wall. <laughs> and it's not real. And the final gag is... When he goes back to the trailer where she's at and tries to sit down on a rock, and we knew it was going to happen before it happened, he sits on it and it cracks and he falls inside of it. He just continues sitting there. And here's when the producer guy pulls up. That's going to be... Really, this is a moment in the film where we are introduced to a character who's going to cause a problem for them to, again, continue. But we'll meet him later, again, because he doesn't like her, and he knows that she's a user. Oh, that was a funny moment. The guy walks up and he goes, well, do we use this, or this, that, or the other thing? The guy goes, do the other thing. Walk away. And here he gives her some shit and grief and tells her, no, she can't stay at the house. So she's got to deal with that now. She's been rejected from staying there. She's got nowhere to go. She's probably got a million dollars worth of jewels on her. <laughs> and is flat broke. Yeah. 
Yeah, she gave she gives her the the coat the and has jewels in it. Yep. And she put it in a secret pocket of the coat. Oh yeah, and this is when she calls Jack, the rich guy, and his wife answers. And of course she's also being obtuse. So she keeps hitting walls everywhere. Real walls. Well, proverbial walls, not literal. Real fake walls. Mm. Yeah, real fake walls. Jeff Bloom's, uh, he's already done that gag. Yeah, that's why I brought it up. I like the James Bond looking poster in the background with a woman. So again, he stuck with her. Yeah, because they couldn't call for a cab. They they were ousted by one of the production assistants by order of the set producer. Who we met, the jerk. Mm -hmm. And there we are on the old... Um, Brooklyn Street set. Man, the, the whole thing with trying to make a phone call, that that can that cannot be done today. We are always back in the freaking cell phone. Yeah, this is definitely a movie at the end of the um, era. The era of old phones. Yeah. Well, nowadays it would be it would be a like stunt cell phone. That's what it would be. You know, you go like, hey, can I borrow your phone? And like, I would look at it, it's like, what? <laughs> Hands it over, tries to play on call and realizes, oh, it's not a real phone. And he is yeah, it's got to start to talk. It's got one of those lit up, it's just a lit up printed screen. <laughs> yeah. She tells him that what she was doing. And with whom? And the, yeah, this the is guy when she finally confides in him, the truth. That she was smuggling jewels. His her friend got killed, but because the guy was her friend, it was from the overthrow of the Shah of Iran. Mm -hmm. So now we know we're dealing with Iranians. Yeah, that's it. Okay. I love the Hostage. banter between these two because they have chemistry in the movie. They really do. God, I miss those days when Jeff Goldblum was really acting. Hell, I miss Michelle Pfeiffer being in good movies. I haven't seen her in anything uh, in the last decade. The last thing I remember seeing her in was that fantasy movie um, with Stardust. Uh, Claire. Yeah, Stardust with Claire Dane. That, that was it. Yeah. She's good in that too. It's it's the sad thing with actresses. It's like once you're past 35, unless I don't know, unless you're like the ultra top like Queen Bee, you're just gonna get dropped. Yep. But we are seeing more and more older actresses get to work again. So that Plus, some of them think ahead and save up and start investing in their own productions, create their own production company. Yeah. And that way they guarantee, guarantee themselves work as long as that production company is profitable. It, it also helps them that the upcoming generation sucks. Like, I've not seen a lot of good male or female actors coming up. Like, By the way, that's Paul Bartel. Another cameo by a, a funny actor, very comedic actor. Little tiny spot. There we are in front of Tiffany. Um, by the way, it's always bugged me. They call it breakfast at Tiffany's. It's not. It's breakfast at Tiffany. Grammar, you know, grammatically, that's how it should have been named. I always thought that was funny that 
a great writer used bad grammar. Oh, Keith is here. If you want to have fun, put the writings of Hamilton through the Hamilton correction. Uh, that little online thing called Hamilton that's supposed to correct your grammar. Put Hamilton's writing into it and watch how many things it tells you is wrong. <laughs> uh, this is a great scene. This is when we get a lot of cameos in, in these follow-up scenes. Um, this scene, if I recall right, this is the, the yeah, this is the casino. Keith, did you yeah. become a bar? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. What's up, buddy? No, I, it's into the night, baby. You know, yeah. one of my all-time favorites. Favorites. Yeah. See, it's not just me, man. The music videos alone make this a film worth. There's watching. Carl Perkins. There's Carl Perkins, the guy who wrote Blue yeah. Suede Shoes, man. Did they already have the uh, Jim Henson scene? I don't, uh, think, I don't think, think that's so. coming up. I think that's coming up. Gary, here in just uh, a few moments. We should go to break. Oh, is it time? All right, let's pause this thing. Yeah. All right, man. We will uh, uh, do our station break here for KGRA. Uh, we will be right back in just a minute. Hi, guys. This is Gary from Pop Culture Minefield here on KGRA, and we're leaving for our first break. I hope we survive. Did you know 75% of America? Hey members, the new KGRA DB app is now available on iOS and Android devices. Gain on demand access to any KGRA DB programming. Download any show directly to your mobile device to listen or watch on the go. Go to the App Store and search KGRA DB. Oh wow, we survived! Welcome back to the commercial break. Now for some more pop culture minefield on KGRA. We are back, yeah. I want to point out something they bring up in there. Uh, a majority, you know, over 70% of people are dehydrated. And it's a fact. One of the first things I learned in weight loss was stay hydrated and that the feelings you think when you're hungry, and this is with a lot of people, 70% of people think they're hungry, but they're not hungry. They're actually thirsty. And, they yeah. want, and the body wants that fluid uh, any way it can get it, even through food. So you think you're hungry. You're not hungry. You're actually thirsty, craving water. And Yeah, uh, but do not hydrate with soda, please. Well, look, I'm going to be one that will argue with that all day long because uh, I have no problem with certain sodas. I have a problem with sodas that have nitrates in them. But I do know that excess use of the soda can do damage to your bones. If you drink too much soda... Uh, the CO2 is bad for you. And the and sugar. I don't drink sugar sodas. I haven't drank sugar sodas in over a decade. But even some of those are bad for you. Anything with a nitro, uh, with um, phosphates in it, uh, that is your dark colas. Your best colas to drink, really, they're no, not really going to harm you, are um, the um, zero sugar uh, Mountain Dew and... Um, God, I just forgot the name of it. It's uh, citrus soda, not Seven Up. Seven Up won't hurt you either. Uh, but um, is it no, not Squirt? But Squirt's another one that falls into that category. That as you're long thinking as you're not sugar. 
you're thinking Sprite or Sierra Mist. And Sierra oh, yeah. Mist doesn't exist anymore. It got replaced by something. No, else. there's another soda. I'll tell you in a second. There is a soda made with grapefruit. And I forget the name of Fresca. it. Fresca. Fresca, thank oh, you. Oh, Fresca. Fresca is another one. Uh, these I are the sodas that, that I like. But I'm not allowed to have Fresca anymore because I take lisinopril, lisinopril hydrochlorothiazide for my um, uh, water retention and for blood pressure. And you cannot have grapefruit if you're on that medication. So I haven't enjoyed that in over 20 years. Motherfucker. So back to the movie. <clears throat> uh, I can tell you it's a matter of life and death. And he's like, you know, all right, I'll pass your information on. But he threatens to beat his ass, you know. Here we go in this scene. Roughs him up a little bit in the bathroom. And there's a funny moment in the bathroom when a guy comes out of the stall. And then a moment later, a girl comes out of the same stall, straightening her clothes out. <laughs> you know, Hollywood, man. If it, they're not doing drugs in the bathroom. They're having sex. There she is. And he just, you know, I love the fact that he plays his character so well of being a fish out of water. It's just not natural to him, none of this. She's out there by the phone waiting. And I think that's called a seti. Is that what call, right? That chair, that cushioned seat. And that's oh, the guy no. she's trying to get a hold of. And uh, he apparently has the, the connections. There's Jim Henson. Yep. Uh, you need to get off the phone, sir. <clears throat> so now he reaches out to help her. She's gorgeous, period. Yeah, Bush. And now we see the four stooges. And he walks right by the clothing store where they're getting fitted. And this leads to a great slapstick moment with the door. Because apparently they have trouble with doors, their characters. And the owner of the place goes, I'll open it! Don't Please don't break my door! <laughs> they go running out with guns and they lose him. They don't see him anymore. And this is the David Bowie scene out in front of Tiffany. There's David. You're very good. <laughs> I've been watching you since you, you left Caper's yacht, you know, and Goldblum's like, I'm, I am? <laughs> he has no idea what he's talking about because Bowie thinks he's a pro. He's just some guy who hasn't slept. <laughs> and Melville, of course, is the Frenchman, the bad guy, one of the bad guys. Everybody's a bad guy. Shaheen is a bad guy. She's a, a Iranian or Persian and um, wants the jewels. I love that. Would you open your mouth, please? <laughs> he puts the gun right into his mouth. <laughs> I love this. Where's the jewels? <laughs> You're very good. You're really good. <laughs> This is just a good movie. It's just a oh, solid, is. solid movie. The writing is so awesome in this. The dialogue. He goes, can we help you? He goes, I think you just did. Because <laughs> it well, caused the bad guy to walk away. This is one of the films that I think helped to inspire the movie After Hours. You know? Yes, and it's very similar. And that one's Martin Scorsese's take mm -hmm. on the exact kind of same story. Fish mm -hmm. out of water. Guy out in a city he's not familiar with, even though he lives there. Seeing the underbelly of the city. And of course, a lot of people don't know that that's also a Cheech and Chong movie. Mm -hmm. they, they're they two characters that keep popping in and out of the movie. They're characters. So she saves him from the cops. And she goes, I think I found a place to go. And um, 
everything will be good. And she offers to pay for his ride or whatever he needs. And he, he's like, no, you're, you're safe now. That's, that's all I care about. I'll, I'll find my way back home. I think by the time this movie comes out, both Michelle Pfeiffer and Jeff Goldblum had been in Hollywood for about the same amount of time. Now, there's an actor I talk about all the time, one of those black actors who made a career playing cops. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite roles was as the cop in Fright Night. Mm -hmm. He was really good in that. I mean, his, his scene in that scene is one of the best scenes, one of the top 10 best scenes in that movie. Stop listening to kids. <laughs> That's what he ends up deciding in that movie. This one, he's the doorman. A lot of cameos in this movie, man. A lot. Yes. Yes. Because uh, it was not in, for some reason I didn't see it, but we got Rick Baker in there too. He has a great moment when yeah. you're pulling up to the movie set. Mm -hmm. Offer some drugs. <laughs> No, we well, this, these are a lot of these cameos are friends personally of the director. Yeah, you know. Oh, I told I was said you know he pulled in a lot of favors for this movie with the casting. Terry Gar is crying in a car. That's it. No dialogue, just her for a moment crying in the driver's seat. That was it. And I'm sure that old guy looking at at porn in his car was probably somebody too. I just don't know who it was. Let's see. He liked doing that. David Cronenberg is his boss. And of course, he gets out and, and about to leave, and then he thinks about something. I can't remember what it is. Get a cab at this hour, and he just, for some reason, I forgot to give her something. And he's like, oh, you can leave with me. And he goes, no, I'd like to give this to her personally. And he goes up to the apartment. And I love this scene. I love the way Landis shot this with a TV in every room. And on every single TV is um, Abbott and Costello Abel. meet Frankenstein. Yeah. No, it's meets Dracula, I think. No, it's meets Frankenstein and Dracula and... and uh, uh, and Lawrence Talbot slash Wolfman, played by Lon Chaney Jr., even though that's not his real biolog I mean, legal name. It's only his acting name. Uh, he is the son of Lon Chaney, but he had a different name. Uh, so he goes in there and he's like, nobody, but there's this Abbott and Costello classic going on. And it's hilarious, man, because there's a scene of tension in the Abbott and Costello movie where he's about to be killed, and it's in... Uh, it happens at exactly the same moment that something's happening to the character in the movie, uh, Jeff Goldblum's character. And it's tied right in. It's hilarious the way he did that. A nice little homage. Total brown shoe moment. Yeah, brown shoe and speed. Yeah, 10 speed and brown shoe. That's what or I was saying earlier. Yeah. Uh, he, this, this film came out about, what, uh, just maybe 10 years after he had already done that. That was in the 80s. No, it was, it was within a few years. Because I think it was in the 80s, wasn't it? Ten Speed and Brown Shoe? No, I think it was the 70s. Late no. 70s. Le very, very late 70s. All right, let's see who remembers it more correctly. I'm always ready to apologize when I'm full of shit. As am I. Nineteen eighty. Eh. We're both writers, right in between us. <laughs> <laughs> and there's that movie. He stops to even look at it. I love that. He stops to look at an Abbott and Costello movie on one of the big screen TVs. It's like, where is she? And this is when he gets the, the big reveal in the, in the main bedroom. And you see bodies on the ground. People are dead. This this showed a lot of range as a director for Jonathan Demme. That's what I say it right now. This is the best film Landis ever made. Don't you mean Jonathan Demme? Demme. He didn't direct it. Landis did. What? What are you saying? I'm not sure what you meant. 
Cool. Hold on, I'm checking on something. And there he has her hostage, knife to her throat. David Bowie. You don't mess with David Bowie, man. And, of course, this scene where he's got the knife over him, you have the same situation going on with Lou Costello in the movie. I love that. And she's trying to get her shit together here. And that's when Carl Perkins, bloody, thought to be dead, pops in and takes over the fight. And Go Bloom and she take off running. Leads to a great <laughs> comical moment when they go down the elevator. As they get to the bottom floor, there's a lady with a dog or something. I can't remember what it is. A man with a dog, with a leash dog, but the, the dog yeah. starts barking. And then the the, the uh, Iranian bad guys see that dog, and what they do is hilarious. Ah, Jeremy Irons. Hey. Wasn't Landis in the in, in the court? the cover no that was jeremy irons cover of gq back when gq is a legitimate magazine and i love this scene when they get the taxi <laughs> and that taxi driver just fucking floors it and just starts doing some crazy pro level driving and he realized that these guys got guns and they're chasing him. And it, it is one of my favorite moments in a movie ever uh, of this taxi driver just floors it and takes off is clearly a pro driver, you know, yeah. and just starts doing some crazy shit, going into a parking garage to lose these guys, uh, outwitting them in the garage by going up so far, then flipping and turning back around and going around the other way while they're still going up and he's leaving. Just insane chase scene. I love this scene. And they're constantly yelling at each other. <laughs> in Iranian, it's so funny. <laughs> and when the taxi driver finally gets him to safety, he just stops the car and yells, Get the fuck out of my car! <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, uh, okay, and they get out, and then he drives off. I love crazy moments like that in film. They did one, a weird one like that in another movie called Life of Brian. The whole alien scene is one of those breakaway moments where you have this insane chase scene that just abruptly begins and abruptly ends. And then it, it's like it has nothing really to do with the rest of the film or the film itself. It's just something that happens in it. This where he doesn't get the fuck out of the car. And then they go to this restaurant. Uh, and this is a real place that doesn't exist anymore. Um, I don't even know if the building still exists. It lasted for 70 years. And finally in the 20 teens, it, uh, it was sold and never reopened. And then I think there are plenty of carrots down the left. By the this is a classic restaurant in LA. Featured in a lot of And these two, I love their these moments in the film where they're just talking in between all the action. And drama. What's the next step? What are we going to do? And so she's figuring out this is what we need to do. And so they begin to form a plan how to end all of it and get out with their life. And that's the hardest part. How do we do this and also survive? Because now he's in the middle of it, whether he likes it or not, he's part of it. She needs to get to Jack. That's one of the main things. She's got to get to Jack. 
and she knows the back way into his pantry. Yeah, back way. Yeah, she's basically explaining how he helped her when she wasn't making it as an actor. This is a really good thing. Nobody's talking, so I guess I'll keep talking. And um, basically, you know, to get to the third act, because that's what we're getting ready to transition into the third act, they have to find a way to resolve it. And it's between this moment and the meeting with Jack that all of the things that are needed come into play for them to do what they need to do. But there is a tight situation where if they swing left or right, it would, it would be utter failure. Yeah. Any thoughts, Keith? I think he's busy. Oh no, we. He had. He's getting connection problem. Good. Ooh. The Sorry, two double dip French dip in a New York pastrami and no mustard. Oh, oh, nice. This is a good restaurant. I didn't get any of the that except maybe in two. I can't help. I don't know what's going on. I'm not sharing any video. I have no idea what I said. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I'm looking at Jeff Goldblum, even his profile picture, just him being the caricature of Jeff Goldblum. It's not Jeff Goldblum. Anymore. Oh, man, this scene. There's the coat. She's wearing the coat. Oh, Scott picked up the home phone. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there is a landline in the top. And there they are. It's the Four Stooges. Always menacing, not much to say. Heads back to her apartment, and of course the place is trashed. They've been there. And there's the famous Frenchman. Yep. Melville. The other villain. Landis doing his typical thing of not saying dialogue and throwing shit around. He's watching him tear apart his awards. I like that. He has a golden globe and he pulls the globe off of the statue. Then she tries. She tries to run for it, and here's the the scene that you were saying before that they start. Yeah, he opens himself. the door, slams it into his face. He they pile into him. He pushes him back, pulls it, and slams it into his face again. Finally, he gets angry at it and shoots the door, and then doesn't even want to bother. They have a troubled door, man. They they don't even bother with the sliding glass door. He just picks something up and throws it through the window. Yeah. And they kick the glass out. <laughs> The neighbor's like, well, that doesn't seem right. Honey, maybe we should call the police. <laughs> They're drowning her in the ocean. <laughs> and I never understood why they just didn't take her back to the apartment. Why they drowned her. I never understood that in the scene. That Was there a purpose for him, them killing her? Well, maybe he's 
it's easier to mm. kill her than to be watching for her. Because they're just going to leave anyway. Once they they were satisfied, they just leave. So I just thought, why didn't they just take her back up there? It's the one moment in the film that kind of bugged me. And Melville here is just basically threatening her, and she says, you know, what you, the worst she could do is kill me. She, he, and he just basically says, do you like Ed's character, Mr. Oakham? You know? And she's like, oh, okay, you're going to threaten me with his life. Okay. So they pull up in front of that house, and the cops are there now, that producer's house. And, um, and here's another weird moment. They seem unaware that she's dead, or he does. In in the dialogue, he's it, it yeah. comes off like he's unaware that she's dead. Well, he's either unaware or he really doesn't care. It's it, I would get it if he didn't care, but it was really weird the way it was it, the lines were written, that it comes off like he's unaware that she's dead, and none of the cops say anything about her being demised because that's why they were called there was the assault on her on the beach. So, and all she wants is that coat. So she yeah. eventually says, can I have that coat? And then this young highway patrolman or sheriff or whatever he is, deputy, um, she asks him to escort her out. He hey, just uh, doesn't like her. The, 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 the detective with his uh, coat off. You know who that is, right? No, I'm, I'm waiting for you to say. That's uh, oh, uh, done. Yep, Lawrence Caston. There you go. A lot of of like every single character in the background or something. There's a potential there of them being, being. Yeah, oh, I recognize him. That's a young Caston. Uh, each one potentially is a, a cameo by one of his friends. Oh, so Jonathan Demi was in that uh, rocket, that engineer scene with her around the conference table. Okay. So that's another writer director that was in that scene, other than uh, Cronenberg. And I like this is one of my favorite moments here where she has the cop there and she starts introducing them by different names. That this is my cook, my French cook. He speaks no English, so he can't talk <laughs> and say anything. And then introduces the the two uh, black gentlemen in the, in the driving compartment as uh, two of their um, uh, employees, and then she, in front of the cops, says, "Would you mind escorting our French cook over to the neighbor's house?" Because <laughs> they can't do anything with the cop there. It's a really clever scene. I love the way she saves their lives by using the cops. Gives them fake names and fake number. <laughs> And Goldblum seems very amused by the whole thing. We're going to be really late. <laughs> oh, that's right. We got to go. <laughs> I love this scene. It's absolutely my favorite scene in the whole movie, this moment. What? It's only a block from here. Can you walk him over there <laughs> and then leaves them all there? <laughs> yeah, I talked about Carl Perkins. Uh, great songwriter. He came up in that uh, that southern rock period, rockabilly period. Mm -hmm. Well, also Blue Lou's in, in the movie. One of the members of the Blues Brothers band is also makes an appearance in this film. Mm. Now we're at Jack's uh, palatial mansion. This is a real location. You can actually go to the locations. Uh, the movie is made out on IMDb. Uh, copy the address that they give and put it into Google and it'll take you there. You can actually go check out these locations yourself. I do it all the time. I love it. Just don't actually go there. That's stalking. <laughs> well, if you go there, immediately leave. Don't hang out there. It's, it's not like you're home away from home. So now we find out there's a, a drainage line that she's been able to sneak in and out of the mansion with. And I like this moment where she says, and then you just open the gate when it gets dark. We had to wait here until it's dark. So they wait till it's dark, and finally when it comes, they go to open the gate, and he, he can't open it. And then she opens it, and he, and he says, you're a lot stronger than you look. 
She and uh, Michelle Pfeiffer and her sister Dee Dee are both in the movie. Dee Dee plays one of the hookers. Oh. Oh, he wakes her up, uh, putting his hand over her mouth. Those are that always goes over well with women. <laughs> <laughs> You speaking from experience, Gary? No, but I just tell you, women do not want to have someone put their hand over their mouth, period. For any that's, reason. That's asking for trouble. I think the only thing I've ever done that came close to that was when my ex-wife was uh, sleeping. I took a squirt gun and squirted her across the rose into her nostril. Wow. <laughs> Shut water right in her nose, Zoe's mother. Just squirt and then turn back around and she's like... <laughs> <laughs> like what the hell happened? And I'm like, you okay? <laughs> oh man, I love this place. And it's a real location. Like I said, they shot on location of this uh, palatial mansion. It's a way of saving money. Mm, you real locations, yeah. Don't don't waste money on building a set. Just go to a real location. Although some of the rooms may be sets. I don't mm -hmm. know. Because, uh, you know, they shot on the Universal lot. And Universal has a lot of fake homes and, and fake city street shit. All of them do. Fox, Warner. There he is, Farnsworth. Great stuntman who became an actor. Very some natural way. Best directors right. have worked with him. And he's worked with some major movie stars. John Wayne, mm -hmm. Clint Eastwood. When he was dying, he made that movie with David Lynch about the brother who drove a lawnmower to visit his other brother. True story. It was his last movie before he died. I have... This is interesting. Keith, can you take over for a second? Martin? Sure. I did. Lots of visual. Hold on. I'll be back. You know, the, the thing about this particular film, I, I, I first became aware of it because MTV had a contest where they would fly you out to uh, go to the world premiere of the film and give you a whole lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, uh, spend some time out there. Uh, and I remember this was a film that my brother and I, my twin brother and I, really, really enjoyed. I mean, we really enjoyed this movie. I have no idea yeah. what it was. Just suddenly my screen disappeared. Um, but Farnsworth is one of my favorite Western actors. A great actor. Uh, he did. Oh my God! He was in misery. He was the sheriff. Oh my God! Mm -hmm. The straight story was a film I was trying to think of. He's also in The Natural with Robert Redford. He was in the, the 1980 western with Steve McQueen, Tom Horn. Uh, he but the movie that I really liked him in is he plays one of the first train robbers, Gray, the Gray Fox. Uh, and what a good film! But the straight story shot in 1999 was his last movie before he died of cancer. He was sick making the movie. Uh, it was a deal that they agreed to is to let him make this movie. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people in Hollywood, uh, filmmakers and actors, love Farnsworth because he was such a great guy. And like I said, you know, he came up as a stuntman. He worked with uh, Yakima, uh, oh, I forgot his last name, um, Canute, Yakima Canute, uh, the great stuntman who did the under the wagon train that was used for Raiders Lost Ark with the truck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He worked directly with him, worked with John Wayne in the early days. Oh, forgot um, his wife. Oh, Via this, Mile, uh, Vera, Vera Myers. Myers. Yeah, yeah, from yeah. Psycho. Yep. She also was a regular on uh, Columbo. Mm -hmm. There he is again, Jake, with his, his neck brace. <laughs> 
Any car. Uh, and that's the car that, that he picks. And she picks the car from the wife. <laughs> the wife's car. Vera Miles, great actress. Body by Jake. Yeah, you remember. You know who Jake is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he, to, uh, according to what I read, he's still training people. He's in his 70s now. Still doing, uh, you know, runs his own gym. Mm -hmm. Still training celebrities. And he's not an actor. He really isn't. But he was one of those people that was tightly knit into Hollywood and had a lot of friends. And Landis was one of those friends. Well, that plus the fact that he, I think they had just launched his body by Jake about two years prior. So they started doing the infomercials. He was becoming known to quote unquote regular people. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was, it was hard to escape those commercials after a while. Oh, I remember, man. Um, it's, uh, it was around the same part of the uh, same period of time as, um, the Dianetic ads. Remember that? Yeah. Body by Jake. Um, this is where the plot begins to move. There's not really been a plot so far, but there's now a plot. And the plot is what they're doing. She and uh, you know, Michelle Pfeiffer's character and Jeff Goldblum's characters. They are moving the chess pieces now. Up to now, they've been pawns running, trying to avoid being taken. And now they are going into the lion's mouth. And I love this scene. Because he goes right to the lady, Sh Shihana, whatever her name is, the Iranian... Yeah, Lord, Play, played by is. Irene Pappas, who is Pappas. a fantastic actress. Now, as I recall, she's Greek. Yes, she is. Look, uh, Zorba the Greek, Z was another one of her movies. But for me, yep. my all-time favorite movie with her in it was The Guns of Navarro. She is so good in that movie. Oh, oh man. I, we're going to be watching that for Military Monday. It's on the list. Um, I have both of the Navarone movies, uh, Guns of Navarone and Force 10. You know, uh, I love the novel. The novel was slightly better than the movie. Well, both novels were because you get you get more definition yeah. of, of things. Yeah. Uh, more of an explanation of who these characters were and why they were the way they were. Mm -hmm. You don't really get that with the movies. There's no time. And, uh, and But I do. I love uh, that's not. Is it Robert Ludlum? No. Who was it that wrote those? No, that's uh, Alistair McLean. Alistair McLean, uh, yeah. God, what's the other movie with Michael Caine that he that uh, they did in the seventies? Um, the Eagle Has Landed, another yeah. classic. McLean. Uh, those are just books that, if you've never read Alistair McLean, you can definitely tell somebody who is of a certain age if you've read Alistair McLean because you couldn't escape from them. those. Movies. Are great World War II books. Period. Oh, uh, and he wrote screenplays too that weren't books first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, where Eagle, was it where Eagles Dare with Clint Eastwood? I think that's one. And Richard, yeah. uh, Richard, Bur Richard Burton. Both actors felt out of place making that movie. And it's a great film. They do great in that film. But Burton was kind of a drunk, and he's like, I can't play a character like this. And Clint Eastwood's like, my character talks too much. <laughs> and that's what, that was yeah. his complaint. He talks too much. I don't, he shouldn't be talking uh, so much. You know, The Guns of Navarone, I think, was also responsible, according to my mom, I, I, I think, according to my dad, I should say, it's one of the reasons why I was named what I was named. So that's where oh. they got my name from. Keith. Oh, okay. For, um, oh, uh, back to the movie. They're walking him in to meet uh, uh, Pappas' character, who is this uh, Iranian warlord of some kind, someone who escaped during the Shah's escape. And she cl lays claim to these jewels, her and her family. And they're willing to do whatever it needs. And now that's Goldblum's job is to go deal directly with them while Michelle Pfeiffer, get, and there they are sitting at that sofa. Jesus. Eating. They're always constantly eating in this scene. It's really funny. I think my favorite moment is when they pull out some kind of hard rock candy and they break it up with a pistol. <laughs> Spread it out. She doesn't know whether I can, can I trust you? Well, you know, I don't know if I can trust you. And then he just starts lying to her, saying all sorts of crazy shit to her. And he says, look, 
we have no choice but to trust each other. And now here she is at the floral shop, and she's hiding the jewels in a stack of flowers. And of course, he's laying down the plans of how this will work out. And again, she just doesn't trust him. And she was just a beautiful woman in her youth. I still think she's really gorgeous, even at this age. Yeah. Well, again, I tell people, if you've never seen the movie, The Guns of Navarone, watch it. And of course, like he brought up, Zorba the Greek with uh, Anthony mm-hmm. Quinn. And Z. Film. And she is... Um, a great Greek actress, and here oh. she is playing an Iranian. But they're so close culturally that you, you do have that mixture where clearly they cross the lines between countries mm-hmm. or regions. And so she tells her, okay, well, I've I'm, I'm done all I've had to do. Thank you. And she leaves because the jewels are there. They're planted where she wants them. You know, and Goldblum is just, he's so tired that he just, there's, he just feels like there's nothing to lose here. He says that I'm Jack's son at one point, <laughs> long lost son. He's just messing with her. But in the end, he makes it clear to her, we, the truth is, you know, basically we have to trust each other here or there's nothing. You get nothing. And we get nothing. Here's when they break up that rock candy. <laughs> the pistol. He's a he pistol like a hammer. He pulls the hand. God, look at him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Landis really landed the physical humor. Because a lot of people don't know that he's he, he was a stuntman. And he loved doing stunts in his own movies. And Mm -hmm. every film he made, there's a little thing here or there. It was his Hitchcock thing, where Hitchcock liked to be in his movies. He liked doing a gag in one of his films. And I don't know if it's in every film, because I don't remember it in Oscar. But he does it in a lot of films. In American Werewolf in London, uh, it's very similar to what he did in in, um, Animal House, uh, where he gets knocked back and in... And in this film, it's almost the same kind of gag. And in the scene on Piccadilly Circus, when the bus wrecks, he's the one thrown through the window of a bookstore. And in here, it's it's the same thing happens at the airport. A very similar gag. I don't know if he's showing off or just having fun. I don't know. It's one of those. gives him some money and he's like why are you giving me money <laughs> and it, that wasn't part of the discussion but okay i'll take your money and if you pay attention at the end that money is what you see at the end of the movie that stack of hundred dollar bills that double stack of hundred dollar bills it'll it pops back up at the very end of the film and it's a subtle it's a subtle little statement I thought was interesting. Did you catch that, Keith? Yeah. The envelope? Yeah. So now all he's got to do is get out of there and go meet her at the airport. She's at the airport, LAX. They're going to get the hell out of Dodge. Everything's falling into place. And she, her goal or job is to call them to give the location But I personally wouldn't have called them until I was in the air or landed at the next location. He gets to the airport, and what he doesn't know is when he was leaving, uh, Pappas' character does a slight nod at the boys sitting on the sofa. And they followed him there to the airport. So he shows up and he goes, let's get out of here. And he, she turns and runs for the phones. And he's like, what are you doing? 
She was like, I have to make the call. And it's like, that was the wrong time to make the call. We're going to miss the plane. Yeah. Right here. And she makes the call, tells him where the, the jewels are. And then they get on the flight. He hurdles the uh, rope and she has to go around. <laughs> And, of course, the minute they uh, get comfortable, they're told there's a delay. Everybody needs to disembark the plane. <clears throat> and the minute they disembark, you can guess who's waiting for him. Because fo they followed him there. Piss poor planning. The three Ps. Get you in trouble every time. Whacking off Canuck. <laughs> That's funny. Rules are rules. You can't stay on a plane. Mm. And there they are all smiling at him. Yeah, we got you. And every single bad guy is now here. You know, um, Melville is there with his henchmen. Goldblum sees him and says, now what's going to happen? <coughs> and they sneak up behind the two Iranian guys in the back. There they are. They're getting around behind them. And they stick them with knives and kill them. And so now we've got a shootout, a potential shootout. And then the feds arrive. Uh, lead agent played by Clue Gulliger. Great actor. Gallagher. He just lost him. He, he died, what, two years ago? I have always said Gallagher. Oh, okay. It's just the way his name is spelled. There's Landis's stunt, where he gets shot into the magazine rack. And then this lone gunman is left. He's all by himself. The brothers are dead. And there he is. There's Clue. And Goldblum just walks up to him. He says, you know... You're a maniac. What, what are you doing? You know, and all these guns are aimed at him. And this is like a, a, one of those stressful moments. And Goldblum's like, maybe you can help me with my problem. Why can't I sleep? Why is my wife sleeping with someone else? What's wrong with me? And the guy just smiles at him when he, he asks that question. Just looks at him. It, it, just for a calm moment, he smiles at him. You know, and it, it's it's such a, a, a really dramatic moment in a comedy. And he takes the gun off of Michelle Pfeiffer and then shoots himself. And I don't know if the guy understood him or just understood the tone at which he was saying it. The compassion in the voice made him realize my brothers are dead. Everything is over, you know, and just kills himself. So now the FBI take him to um, the Ramada. <laughs> and she says, maybe we're dead. He goes, they, they don't take you to the Ramada when you're dead. <laughs> There's no Ramada in hell. <laughs> and she, of course, finds the jewels. That were left behind for her and immediately is busted by the, the cops, the FBI. They're taken into this room at the Ramada. And it, this is one of those great moments with bureaucrats where you have FBI agents who don't really serve any purpose. They're just bureaucrats. They're not uh, real agents. They don't know how to talk. And Clue's character just shuts him up. You know, he's just, just I got this, go. And... They are left, uh, they get to wash up here, and then they're left all this money by Jack. I'll wait for it here, because I do like this moment when Clue came, they dumped this bag of money on the bed. And there's Clue. 
and he doesn't know what to make of this whole situation. I don't know what's going on here, why this favoritism is being shown to you, and that's where he tells the two agents to excuse themselves. Just, just get out. And, and he's like, I don't know what's going on here. This is untraceable money. And it's yours, but you can't leave this hotel for 24 hours. Do not leave this room. You must not leave this room for 24 hours while we're basically cleaning up everything. And, uh, and he's really thrown off by this. And then you can see a little bit of annoyance with him. When, you know, they're like, is there anything else? Is that it? And his character turns around and grabs some of the money and puts it into his pockets. He is, he stops before leaving. He looks at him and goes, who the hell are you going to tell? And he walks out with some of the money. <laughs> I like that moment. It was great. And then after that, you're on your own. And so she goes to take a shower he's watching the cowl commercials again from the bed and for the first time since we met him in the movie he falls asleep it's almost like everything's fallen into place for him or he's reached that point of exhaustion where his body says okay that's it you've got to go to sleep No gratuitous scenes with Michelle Pfeiffer here. We got that one nude moment early on. That's it. I have never stayed at a Ramada. I wouldn't. I'm a days in and holiday in guy. Stay at the hide a couple times. Not bad. Hey, so she Shane's comes out. House. Hey, my buddy Shane Moore. What's up, Shane? Wilson's niche. Niche. Uh, he's speaking, of course, uh, Ojibwe, Chippewa. And this would be the entire reason you would do the movie. Michelle Pfeiffer kissing you. Yep, she gives him a smack, and he is sound dead asleep. Ain't nothing waking him up. And then when he does wake up, the money's gone. <laughs> what? What? Yeah, great anime moment. What? <laughs> Little cigarette ad in the in the movie. There you go. She's nowhere to be found. He sits down. He's trying to figure out what's going on, and then he sees his jacket. And there's an envelope sticking out. So he grabs the envelope, and so you understand. She took all of that money. That is the, the, the two stacks that were given to him by the Iranians. The, that's she's the saying, only one. this is my money, that is your money, is what she says by that action. I thought that was interesting. And he's, of course, have you seen her? Well, that was two days ago. And he's like, I slept for two days, looks at his watch. And then he turns, and there she is, standing at the end of the hallway with the bag, waiting for him. And she just smiles at him. And that's all you need. <laughs> you don't need a flying off into the sunset. You just know that it's a happy ending. And then we get the great introduction of all the people in the movie. Catherine. Yeah, Catherine Harold. This is one of the things I do miss from the 80s. Paul Mazursky, they... that's who he was. Paul Mazursky, another director. Roger, I love that guy as, as Melville. The the looks on his face when he's annoyed. Great Bruce, Bruce McGill. McGill. I love that guy. Animal House. D-Day in, in Animal yeah. House. That's right. La John Landis. <laughs> And, of course, I love that Landis ends his movie, and I left it in here at the end, right there. When in <laughs> Hollywood, visit Universal Studios, ask for Babs. And what is that from, Keith? I know, I know. 
say? Animal House. Animal House. Babs was one of the hot looking girls in the sorority. Because she went to work for Hollywood in Hollywood as a, a tour guide. <laughs> She's the one who loses her clothes at the uh, end of the third act. Yes, yeah. that's right. She goes naked. Um, that was a lot of fun. I love that movie so much, man. It's a good film. Um, I dated a girl named Ramada. That's a, what a weird name. I've I I went out with a girl. I didn't date her. I went out with a girl. Uh, her name was India. And that was interesting. Somebody named India. So, but I don't know if you guys have seen the film. If you have not, I highly recommend watching the movie in its entirety. Uh, it is absolutely on my top 20 list of favorite films of all time. It is absolutely my favorite, John, even above, I mean, uh, um, American Werewolf. It, I love this film more than American Werewolf. And I do love American Werewolf. It's my second favorite Landis film. Oscar's in there too. Fine. Oscar's like the fourth one. Because I love the movie Oscar. It's like a stage play. It's a movie done like a stage play. You know, one of those great uh, cheeky comedies that you would go to see in a, in a stage theater back in the 50s or 40s. Oh, you were lying for comedy. That's okay. I wasn't. I actually went out with a girl named India. But I didn't go out with her. I just I did go out with her. I just didn't date her. She was really nice. I met her through Matt McGuire, the guy from Guar, because he went out with her for a while. And we were trading back and forth with girlfriends for a while. If he's willing to lie for comedy, is he willing to kill for it? How far does his loyalty to comedy go? I don't know. That's a good question. Are you willing to kill for comedy? <laughs> and then he would say, if he says yes, then you go, are you lying now? <laughs> Are you willing to do what Daffy did and die for comedy? Exactly. So we're down to the last few minutes here. Any last thoughts, Keith, on this? Uh, just check out some of the music videos that they were. There were three music videos put out for this movie, and I got to say, it, it, it's just amazing to watch all three of them. Especially when you realize he's actually playing keyboard for him in all three videos. But and of course, BB just... King. Uh, did the song there at the end he also does it's used at the opening too they open it's a bookcase song it's opens the movie and ends the movie same song mm -hmm. into the night yep and uh and baby king is one of those guys i not only went to see live but because mrs adeg balola was with the uppity blues women they opened for him uh jim woodward all of us got to go backstage and meet bb king <sighs> wow and that was that was one of my favorite moments in my life but uh, I do not have the list now because I had to leave the studio. So, um, oh, you are welcome to say the names, Martin. Oh, I'm. Uh, I apologize for the <laughs> butchering, but here we go. This Monty is going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm a confuser. Sean Step, Benny, Bush, McFadden, Slasher Fred. Sax, the Peter Bregman front side, Kili Chow, Andy Morrow, Sakura 315, James Andrew Morrison, The Memes of Destruction, Railway Nation, E. Clave Thomason, and Shane Moore. <gasps> and uh, Shinatsky says, Butcherin. <laughs> Butcherin. <laughs> Like you did it. Whoosh. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today. I want to thank our audience on KGRA and on Rumble. Uh, we are messaging Stream Yard to let them know, hey, man, include the chat on Rumble so we can talk to everybody and they can talk to us. Uh, I want to thank everybody. And by the way, uh, Bill, when we after the show, I'll let you know we are going to be launching our uh, Rumble channel too. So we'll be doing ours too uh, to go along with KGRA's. Um, and they do have a free account. You don't have to pay, but if you want unlimited streaming, you have to pay. And I don't know what that means. And that's what I got to find out before we launch it. So, but I want to thank everybody for listening to the show, especially our KGRA audience. And those of us that have joined us on YouTube, 
Uh, everybody have a wonderful weekend and go watch this movie and share movies with us. If there is a movie that you want us to talk about on Saturday or on Military Monday, let us know. Comment in the chat. I mean, in the comments below the video, let us know what movie you'd like us to pick up. And I will read and I will comment and I will make note of it. And we will cover that film at some point. Uh, and if it's a really good film, sooner than later. So, but I want to say, hey, Cl hey, Clay Thompson's here too. Porky's, uh, absolutely classic, but we already covered that one on um, uh, Toxic Tuesday. And I don't want to repeat stuff that we've done on other shows because I consider Toxic Tuesday just another show that I do. And I, I, I hate repeating myself. I hate repeating myself. I hate saying the same thing the same way in a different way, but still saying the same thing. Bill, save him from again. himself, please. Because redundancy is something I'm not into. Have I found like multiple different ways of saying the same thing? <laughs> and that's okay. why we love him. Hey, I want you to have some of that in honor of me, Bush. I love Fresca and I miss it. I've not had it in 20 years. That makes me mad because that's a great soda right there. I consider it better than Mountain Dew when it comes to flavor. There's no caffeine in it, but it's a delicious soda. With that, everybody, have a great weekend. Uh, be sure to comment, like, subscribe, and share us out to your friends because uh, this show is only going to make it because of you guys. It's not us. We're just having fun. Have a great weekend. Godspeed. Those sons of bitches. Ma, I'm doing a show!